Greetings and a very warm welcome, dear listeners. I'm elated to share with you that Migro has successfully concluded its fourth year of operation and the company is heading full steam into year five. I want to sincerely thank all the customers, partners, Migros directors and the service providers who have been with us thus far and hopefully will be for much, much longer to come. This episode's a little different from my previous ramblings. My favorite topic, ERM, is taking a breather for now. Instead, I will share some of the experiences I made over the past years setting up and running Migro. Hopefully my thoughts are helpful to others who are in a similar situation prior to a startup journey or any other career move. Often I do get asked, how and why did you choose to leave the corporate world and embark on this journey? Before setting up Migro, I went through a high-level, structured thought process designed to help me in answering the what's next question. I wholeheartedly recommend this approach to anybody who is looking to make any career move. Let me explain. The thought process is about answering three related yet different questions pertaining to your skills, your preferences and perceived opportunities. If, where and when there is overlap between the answers, I can see the manifestation of this overlap as an attractive career move. First, think about what you're really good at. This can be any combination of hard and soft skills. Secondly, reflect on your professional passion or in colloquial terms, what gets you out of bed in the morning. Thirdly, you need to be very clear whether the intersection of your skills and passion has a market now and is likely to have a market in the future. I use the term market in the very widest sense of the word in this context. This can be anything from entrepreneurship to arts to charity work whatever is within your interest. So the intersection of the three circles, or rather the answers to the three questions, is a very good starting point to plan. I came up with this three realms idea a while ago when I helped a charity to guide young students along their journey. It is somewhat linked, but not a copy, to the well-known Japanese method of Ikigai. Ikigai is more complex and philosophical than my simple three circles method. Whilst I find this three circles approach very intuitive and extremely helpful, it's crucial to be open-minded for new ideas and opportunities that lay outside of the three realms. Sometimes a good opportunity comes along, hence it's important to stay alert and curious all the while. After all, outcomes matter, not processes. In my case, I'm very passionate about enterprise risk management because it's a greatly undervalued strategic tool. Second, it is a current and future market for it. And most humbly, I also think I acquired hard and soft skills necessary to support customers along their ERM journey. Later in this episode, I will share a few examples during my Migro journey where the three circles overlap well and other cases where there was not even a touch point, let alone an overlap. So the perceptions. Often I'm asked about the benefits of entrepreneurial freedom or more casually put, life must be wonderful without the boss. This probably is the single biggest misconception about a micro enterprise. Whilst I do agree that processes are lean and mean, Migro is nimble and efficient, I do have entrepreneurial freedom to manage my time, and yes, nobody can commandeer me around. However, the pressure and expectation are of a totally different nature when running your own company. As a micro entrepreneur, I'm acting in splendid isolation or in intellectual loneliness. I realized this risk of being an eremite very early on and started building a network of like-minded professionals who are in similar situation. I'm grateful to Acacia Limited in Hong Kong, AKR Cell Consulting and Corwolf Primate Limited in Singapore, Qualibrate in Malaysia and Dr. Besson in Manila for being such great sparring and business partners over the years. We really do help each other as peers, as idea reviewers, we share practicalities, sometimes act as mutual IT help desks, and much, much, much more. In addition, I regularly tell myself two things. Number one, you are doing your current best, and number two, you continue improving. The money. I was initially planning to dedicate an entire chapter of this podcast to the pecuniary aspects of setting up and running a small business. However, during the scripting of the episode, I realized that this topic is best parked in a separate episode. There's so much to share about money matters that it will easily fill an entire story or maybe a series of episodes or maybe even an 
entire podcast on its own. So stay tuned for that. The emotions. The most gratifying experience is direct, positive feedback from a customer. Believe me, it does not get better than this. Clients have told me that my work or what I've delivered together with Migros partners has made tangible impact to the bottom line, or it has solved some of their communication challenges, might have opened new sources of revenues, or drove their strategic thinking. This feedback is so valuable to me, especially since I use outcomes matter as a tagline very often. In other words, there were moments of grandiose joy and reasons to celebrate lavishly. Having said that, there have been difficult and challenging periods as well. At one moment in the not too distant past, my name card stock was gravitating towards zero and, despite ongoing, numerous efforts, not a single new mandate was in sight. At that stage, I was pondering for a very brief moment whether I really needed to print another stack of name cards or just let it all hit zero. Of course, I did print a new box of name cards, but still. How do I deal with these challenges? I'd like to share a few points that certainly have helped me over the years. First, never, 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 never stop the marketing and the networking. This is obvious, but allow me to repeat it. Never, 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 never stop it. Secondly, spread the marketing wider than your target client base. After all, often an indirect recommendation or an indirect source of information might be valuable one day. Thirdly, it is okay to chill occasionally, but keeping a good professional routine combined with a balanced lifestyle is such a great baseline. Men sana in corpore sano, the old Romans knew that already. Fourth, occasionally, and I emphasize occasionally, redo the skills, preference, market thinking process. Especially in times of great innovation, a certain skill can lose its edge rapidly, or another skill becomes a rare commodity overnight. Think of film cameras and radiologists. I emphasize on the word occasionally, because if you feel the need to reevaluate your three circles several times a day, something definitely isn't right with at least one of them. And last but not least, reflect on your value proposition. Is it really unique what and how you are delivering? You might have the greatest product or service on a standalone basis, but if somebody offers you a service or product as a free part of another package, then the market simply isn't there and in all likelihood will not return either. Practicalities. I move on to a few practical observations and suggestions. Hopefully some of you find these considerations valuable and helpful for your own decisions. The outsourcing question. If you start and maybe remain, for lots of good reasons, a micro-enterprise, you have to decide and regularly evaluate what you will do yourself and what is best outsourced. I probably could do most internal tasks such as accounting, statutory reporting, data management, compliance and logistics myself. However, how efficient is this solo approach and will I achieve the best outcome if I really do or try to learn how to do all these things myself? I'll pick three examples to share my experience, the thought process behind my decisions and the actual outcomes. Firstly, the micro company logo. Almost every time I give a name card to somebody, I note from their facial expression and subsequent comments how much they like the logo. I think it's a stroke of genius. Did I design the logo? I wish I could create an item of such beauty, but no chance. The three circles model that I described a few minutes back led me very quickly to the conclusion that designing a logo is not something I should try to do myself or even aspire to learn. The detailed self-assessment reads as follows. I really do love creating visual things. I have the passion. Hence circle number one gets a tick mark. Secondly, there definitely is a market for well-designed logos. In other words, two boxes are ticked already. However, do I have the skills to design a logo or could I acquire them within a meaningful time frame? The straightforward answer is no. I realized the latter a long time ago, so I didn't even bother thinking about designing a logo myself. Luckily, my partner, JC, is, a very, is very good with colors, shapes and designs, so all credit to her for designing this beauty of a logo. If you're interested in the history and the making of the logo, head over to the Migro website 
on the www.migro.asia. So in conclusion, the logo design is a clear case where a do-it-yourself approach would not have resulted in anything meaningful. Next, I talk about the social media web presence of Migro. Same three questions. All answered with a yes for me. Therefore, I decided to do the website, the podcast, Twitter and LinkedIn myself. I re-evaluate this decision occasionally. Thus far, the conclusion remains unchanged. The Migro website initially served a compliance purpose. I wanted potential clients to get background information about myself and Migro. Furthermore, all stakeholders who visit the site should get the impression that a real business run by a real professional drives the content. When I launched the website a few years ago, I wanted to have more and better content than just what we do and about us. Driven by this urge, back in 2015, I overdid it with the content, so the webpage became bloated with duplicated and triplicated content. Over time, I've reduced the number of pages, and most of the new content flows into the blog section, keeping the other pages stable. The width and the breadth of the site feels very appropriate now. The list of required features for the website was and remains straightforward. A light design that scales well on different devices, on different operating systems and browsers. Standard fonts and colors, easy to manage, security taken care of. It should provide for pages and a platform for regular blogging and the basic social media buttons must be there as well. And lastly, the platform needs to be coding free and Visivic style editing. After a bit of trying and tinkering, I settled after about a year and a half with the official WordPress theme in 2017 and its subsequent updates. I switched over to the controversial Gutenberg editor halfway through 2019 because I find it intuitive and easy to use. And soon I might consider migrating the layout to the official 2020 WordPress theme. A few years into being a webmaster and content creator, I feel comfortable making the following recommendations. One. As long as your web presence consists of a few static pages plus a blog, there really, really is no need to invest in expensive web design, plugins and other customizations. I do, however, strongly recommend getting a proprietary URL for your company. I would also vouch for leaving no stone unturned in finding a good class host. Speed, reliability, security and services of paramount importance no matter how big or small the business is. I choose Oxac Private Limited in Singapore because they flawlessly host my personal website for 15 years. The service is excellent, I never had a security issue, backups are available and support is as fast and as good as I need it. As a side note, if you are a WordPress user, there are meetups of the local WordPress community in most bigger cities. Highly recommended events to network and learn. I got many an inspiration from such meetups. The final example is a great learning out of a marketing approach that didn't go too well. Together with a partner company of Migro, I spend a lot of time using modernish looking templates to compile a content rich hard copy brochure outlining the things we do. We invested significant time and other resources on it, had our fun and our discontent, got it printed on high quality paper and distributed quite a few. Initially we were quite elated with the outcome. More recently however, Each time I pick up a copy in my office and look at it, my enthusiasm to take it to a client meeting gravitates closer to zero, to a point where I don't use the brochures anymore. There just should be much more oomph in that leaflet. So the more I think about it, the more obvious it gets. We should have outsourced the design and the layouting. Hence, if I ever decide that Migro needs a hard copy brochure again, money will be spent on the design, a lesson well learned. What's next? What are the plans for Migro heading into year five and further? I'm closing this podcast by going back to the three circles approach that I described earlier on. My passion for enterprise risk management remains strong. My relevant experience grows with every mandate. I keep my knowledge current. And last but not least, the market certainly is expanding. Hence, ERM will remain a core offering of Migro in the future. Secondly, I've rediscovered my passion for teaching and coaching. Asia remains knowledge hungry, if you allow me the generalization for now, and I've honed my teaching and coaching skills. Hopefully knowledge and experience sharing will become a slightly stronger leg to stand on going forward. And lastly, my track record as an executive, particularly in generating growth and positive 
costs is another valuable asset to Migros clients in the form of strategy advice or an interim mandate as a C-suite executive. Hopefully you got some helpful ideas for your own journey out of this podcast. Everything my partners and I offer is listed on the Migros website. You can contact me via social media, LinkedIn and email. Details are in the show notes below. Dear listeners, thank you very much for being with me during this podcast. I sincerely hope you enjoy whatever you're doing. And please subscribe to this channel to get the latest updates automatically. Goodbye for now and stay tuned for the next episode of the Migros Podcast.